Tonight, after a shocking mass shooting near Toronto, details about the victims, the shooter and the gun. Officers arrived to find a horrific scene. What police say they'll be looking at as they search for a motive. The January 6th committee recommends criminal charges against Donald Trump, but what happens next? If we are to survive as a nation of laws and democracy, this can never happen again. Bringing back the remains of a Canadian veteran killed in Ukraine. We didn't want him alone being shipped in a box like an Amazon package. A family struggled to ensure a respectful journey home. This is The National with Anita Bath. Good evening. Adrian is away tonight. Residents of a condo building just north of Toronto are still reeling. On Sunday evening, one of their neighbours, armed with a semi-automatic handgun, stalked their halls, targeted victims and shot them. Investigators are still piecing together the sequence of events and a motive. The building, with multiple floors, now crime scenes, is located in the city of Vaughan. Five residents were killed before police fatally shot the suspect, a 73-year-old with a history of erratic behavior. A sixth victim, a 66-year-old woman, is in hospital with serious injuries. Thomas Degla is in Vaughan tonight. Investigators spent the day combing through this condo building near Toronto after a deadly rampage. York Regional Police dispatched officers in full tactical gear Sunday night amid reports of an active shooter. Officers arrived to find a horrific scene, with five deceased victims having been shot and killed in three separate units. Officers also found 73-year-old Francesco Villi, armed with what investigators describe as a semi-automatic handgun. They always had problems with him. This it could have been all avoided. The man was known to neighbours for a long-standing dispute with the condo board. Police confronted him in a hallway. I don't believe there was an exchange of gunfire. I don't have information on that. I believe it was one officer who fired at the man and he was killed. Court documents show in 2018, the condo corporation sought a restraining order against Villy for his threatening, abusive, intimidating and harassing behaviour. We all felt threatened all the time. A court told him to stop posting on social media about the case, but Villy continued to share rants online. Build the condominium buildings according to the Ontario Building Code. So I did not have to do this. An Ontario court justice once found Villy's gripes about the condo corporation to be frivolous. John Santoro served on the board five years ago. I was lucky that I was trying to help him. Uh, if I wasn't trying to help him, my story could have been changed uh, tremendously last night. Neighbours remain stunned. With warnings about the suspected shooter for years, many wonder whether this could have been prevented. Now, police have not formally released a motive in these attacks, but today, actually, Villy was due in court amid his dispute with the condo board, and among those killed, police say three were members of that same board. Anita. Okay, so Thomas, what more do we know about the shooter's gun and how he actually got it? Investigators have only said it was a semi-automatic handgun. And remember, just recently, the federal government banned the sale of handguns in Canada. But anyone who had already legally purchased one and registered it could keep their handgun. And now investigators are looking into whether Villy had legally obtained his handgun or not. Thomas, thank you. Today, the prime minister was asked for his reaction to the shooting. My thoughts go out to uh, all the families, all the residents, people who are extraordinarily shook up, people who've lost loved ones uh, in this terrible attack. Obviously, there's uh, lots, to, uh, lots to reflect on and to learn about as the investigation continues. Um, but I think it's worth it remembering and highlighting the extraordinary work that first responders did in uh, running into a dangerous situation to try and save lives. Trudeau shared that comment while speaking with Chief Political Correspondent Rosemary Barton. In the United States today, an unprecedented move from the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack. Lawmakers recommended criminal charges against former President Donald Trump and several others close to him. Katie Simpson now with what committee members said and what could happen next. The weight of history heavy upon their shoulders. Lawmakers investigating the January 6th attack took the kind of action they hope will bring severe consequences 
and serve as a deterrent. Ours is not a system of justice where foot soldiers go to jail and the masterminds and ringleaders get a free pass. The committee voted unanimously to urge the Department of Justice to charge Donald Trump with four crimes, obstruction of an official proceeding, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to make a false statement, and inciting or assisting an insurrection. This was an utter moral failure and a clear dereliction of duty. No man who would behave that way at that moment in time can ever serve in any position of authority in our nation again. The committee also made criminal referrals against one of Trump's lawyers, John Eastman, and other allies still to be named publicly. And it referred four Republican members of Congress, including Kevin McCarthy, who is poised to become House Speaker, to the Ethics Committee for ignoring subpoenas. If we are to survive as a nation of laws and democracy, this can never happen again. As significant as this moment is, it's largely symbolic. The recommendations are simply suggestions. Now it's up to the Department of Justice to make a decision uh, as to whether or not they can be successful in prosecuting the case. This former U.S. Attorney General says prosecutors have to be cautious given the explosive political sensitivities of this case. What are you expecting to happen next? They're probably going to issue subpoenas for more information. Uh, and then after gathering up the additional information, then perhaps down the road, we're going to see possible indictments and then moving forward with a possible criminal trial. And sometimes, it, you know, the wheels of justice grind slowly. Katie, how is Donald Trump responding to this? It's exactly what you would expect. He's calling the charges fake. He says that attacking him only makes him stronger and that this is yet another attempt to stop him from running to be the president of the United States. Trump still enjoys a healthy amount of support among Republican voters. And these criminal referrals, that's unlikely to change that. And when you think about the situation, the explosive allegations, the mountains of evidence, and the fact that Trump still has millions and millions of supporters, it has some lawmakers in this country, some concerned about the future of American democracy. Katie Simpson in Washington tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Disgraced film mogul Harvey Weinstein has been convicted of one count of rape at a trial in Los Angeles. The jury acquitted him on another charge and couldn't reach a verdict on two others. 70-year-old Weinstein faces 60 years to life in prison. He's currently appealing another conviction in New York for rape and sexual assault. Well, it's being called a peace pact with nature, an historic agreement to protect 30 percent of the world's biodiversity by 2030. Nearly 200 countries signed on today in Montreal, and the aim is no less than to save the planet. Jayla Bernstein was there. A celebration after negotiators pulled an all-nighter. Suddenly, a landmark deal was gaveled into history in the middle of the night. Despite some concerns, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework was adopted with overwhelming support from most countries. This is my 23rd, 22nd or 23rd COP, and I've never seen a presidency text table and have so much support for it from the get-go. It was huge effort done to, to, to find the landing zone and, and get everyone on board. Getting here took four years of fraught negotiations through pandemic delays, all while a million species face extinction and forests that could help solve climate change are cut down. I don't know you, but I feel much more comfortable and proud <laughs> to look in. The agreement urges partnership with Indigenous peoples, pledges at least 200 billion U.S. dollars per year by 2030 for developing nations, and encourages companies to report their impacts on biodiversity. Of the greenwashing measures. It's all pretty words, says this environmentalist. I think it's a bad deal. She says the wording should be tougher on businesses. Measures that really make sure that any kind of severe impact is just prohibited. The hope that the attention on these negotiations will put pressure on global leaders. The whole world was watching us here. Almost 200 countries have signed a contract in the media spotlight, um, in the public spotlight, and, and we now have to deliver. 
there is still a mountain of work ahead. Now comes the hard part of countries having to actually transform these words into action. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. People in Ukraine's capital woke up to explosions and power outages this morning after another Russian drone attack on the power grid. Ukraine's military says it shot down most of the kamikaze drones targeting critical infrastructure like power stations, but some did get through, leveling buildings and starting fires in and around Kyiv. There are no reported deaths or injuries. Billionaire Elon Musk is keeping the world guessing a full day after posting a baffling Twitter poll. As Anis Haidari tells us, Musk says he is staking his job on the outcome. It's been less than two months since he took over, but Elon Musk is already signaling he might give up the corner office at Twitter. The billionaire put up a poll asking users if he should step down as head of Twitter, adding he'd accept the results. More than 17 million votes. A majority said he should go. Analysts aren't shocked. It does seem a little weird how he's been going about running this company. And I, I'm not alone here, right? Unusual behavior from Elon Musk isn't new, but his actions at Twitter could be damaging his flagship company. I think there's a real feeling that Elon Musk has taken his eye off the Tesla ball, really, since the purchase of Twitter. It seems he's dedicated an awful lot of his time to try to turn around Twitter and make it the company he wants it to be. As Tesla stock has dropped, Musk lost the title of richest person on earth, and he sold billions of dollars worth of the stock days ago. Musk didn't disclose why he sold, but experts speculate he needs cash for Twitter. Musk is essentially using Tesla as his own ATM machine. And in the eyes of Wall Street, he's gone from a superhero to a villain. Most of Musk's money lives in Tesla stock. And the more Tesla he sells, the lower its prices could go, leading to investors losing money. Yeah, I think in the last week, stock's down almost 20 percent. Musk has tweeted he'd be hard to replace at Twitter. And he says no one who can keep the company alive wants the job. Working for Musk is difficult and backs against the wall. And he's ultimately going to have to you know, really pick a CEO that could weed this thing higher. More than a day after the poll went up, Elon Musk still hasn't said whether he'll actually step down from Twitter. So for now, that blue bird remains an albatross, at least for Tesla shareholders. Anis Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. A U.S.-based gaming giant has agreed to half a billion dollar settlement. Epic Games, the developer of the widely popular game Fortnite, will refund players $245 million. It misled some people into unintended purchases made because of the game's design. Epic will also pay a $275 million penalty for illegally collecting the personal information of children. Well, winter weather is once again wreaking havoc in southwest B.C. Icy roads and sidewalks are creating treacherous conditions and some people are struggling to stay safe and warm. As Lindsay Duncombe tells us, it's only going to get worse before it gets better. The rituals of winter are unfamiliar here. Well, minus nine right now. We're not used to this cold weather at this time. Actually, at any time. Daniel Ching would usually spend the day outside collecting bottles. Instead, he's crowded in a warming centre with other people who don't have anywhere else to go. Today I didn't even leave the shelter. It's too cold. He's struggling, he's struggling, he's struggling. Drivers are unpracticed in snow. Oh my God, good thing we pulled off. This is what Highway 1 looked like on this morning's commute. Icy gridlock. This afternoon, a blunt message from the province. If you don't have winter tires, and many don't, stay off the roads. Ice and snow are slowing down planes too. As the delays pile up, the waits get longer. This Whistler bike mechanic is headed to Dublin to see his sick grandma. He'll be late. How about a day? Yeah, there's not too much though. So I'll get there. Getting anywhere is tough if you're on foot using a walker. The ice is broke up there, and it makes it really hard and dangerous for me. Valerie Longjohn moved to Vancouver from Saskatoon to get away from weather like this. Two weeks ago, I phoned my daughter-in-law, and she said it was minus 41. 
and they had so much snow that her husband couldn't uh, shovel all the snow away. So it could be worse. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, a lot worse. Bad news though, worse is coming. And we're going to get some heavy snowfall through places like Victoria, Vancouver, Fraser Valley, and the Okokohala as well. So, you know, there's going to be uh, quite a bit of snow from tonight into tomorrow morning. Lindsay, what are the concerns as this unfolds over the next 24 hours? Well, there is the potential for another frustrating and maybe even dangerous commute tomorrow morning. Remember, just a couple of weeks ago, the snow hit as Vancouver drivers were just going home. In that case, Anita, some people had to stay up to 12 hours in their cars. So having just gone through that, there is anxiety about what the next day or so could bring. Yeah, it was absolute chaos for sure. Lindsay Duncombe in Vancouver. In the U.S., officials are investigating after dozens of airline passengers were injured when their flight hit severe turbulence. I just pray to God that the plane wouldn't fall apart. Passengers on a flight from Phoenix to Honolulu say they were thrown out of their seats and objects were sent flying as the plane violently shook. Photos show damage to the plane and the mess after it landed safely. 20 people were taken to hospital, including 11 with serious injuries. Safety experts say the incident is a reminder to always wear a seatbelt when seated in a plane. <laughs> Thailand's Navy has rescued dozens of sailors and is searching for dozens more after one of its warships sank. The Thai Royal Navy Corvette was caught in a storm off the southwest coast. It capsized and went down in rough seas late Sunday night. To Canada's housing crunch now, which has trapped a group of home buyers in Ontario. They signed on to buy homes that weren't built yet, back when the market was sky high. Now, as Ryan Patrick Jones tells us, they're in a serious bind. These homes are set to be completed next year, but many of the people who agreed to buy them may never get to move in. We are not even sure if we will be able to close this property or not. The house Pornima Malassetti agreed to pay $1.9 million for in October 2021 is now being appraised at $1.6 million. That's the amount a bank would give her a mortgage for. She'd have to cover the difference. We are not able to eat. We are not able to rest. We are not able to do anything how are we going to close and what happens if we don't close what are the bad effects buyers who can't close could lose their deposits and be taken to court malasetti is one of eight buyers cbc news spoke to all in a similar situation many who were pre-approved for mortgages can no longer pass the federal stress test those that can are being offered hundreds of thousands of dollars less than their purchase price from lenders or monthly mortgage rates they can't afford. Me and my wife, I think we haven't slept for the last three months. Since these interest rates are going up, we haven't slept. The buyers are asking the builder, Paradise Developments, to extend closing dates or reduce purchase prices. This weekend, several protested outside its sales office. In a statement, Paradise Developments says it works directly with purchasers throughout the process and it made business decisions and financial commitments based on the agreements signed with buyers. Real estate experts say buying unfinished homes is risky. Reconstruction is a highly speculative investment uh, for this reason, because you're, it only makes sense if prices keep rising. Some industry figures CBC News spoke to say the market could stabilize sometime next year, but that likely won't help the Paradise buyers. Emotionally and financially, this going to disturb my whole life. Ryan Patrick Jones, CBC News, Toronto. Like many places in the country, Saskatchewan is dealing with long hospital wait times and packed emergency rooms. That's having a ripple effect on ambulance services as well. As Laura Sharpaletti shows us, it's taking an increased toll on the mental health of paramedics. This is Peaches here. Samuel Colin spends these days tending to his rescue animals. He's always been a caregiver. Colin trained to be a paramedic at age 19. He wanted medical training in case his father, a severe alcoholic, ever needed help. Now 25, Colin is the one who needs help. 
He's been at home on mental health leave since September. The pressure has been building on paramedics like him since the pandemic. For quite a while, they were actually using the EMS garages for um, patients to basically be in there on beds because there was no room in the waiting room, there's no room in the hallway, there's no beds available. And for just be advised, we have no units available. Lots of calls holding. We'll get to this one again. On one recent day, Regina was fully staffed with 11 ambulances and unable to respond to 135 calls. Because of Saskatchewan's backed up health care system, many EMS workers find themselves waiting with their patients until they're admitted, unable to respond to calls. This Saskatoon psychiatrist says paralyzing paramedics who are trained to help leads to mental health issues. Let's put them in the middle of an ER where they're hearing people in distress. They're seeing all the people who aren't getting their needs met. We're inherently making them powerless. The stress has worsened Colin's bipolar disorder. I wasn't sleeping. I would be awake for three or four days at a time uh, when I was off shift. And um, it ruined my life, honestly. Saskatchewan's Ministry of Health tells CBC News it empathizes with the challenging situations EMS workers are facing right now and says it's providing mental health support. Support Colin is using, along with writing out his thoughts, anything to calm his mind. Laura Sharpaletti, CBC News, Regina. Ottawa begins phasing out single-use plastic bags nationwide tomorrow, but there are concerns about what is replacing them. Are you able to reuse all of these? No, I can't. It's never ending. Look at that. Up next, why the rise of reusable bags could be bad for the environment. Plus, one family struggled to repatriate a Canadian fighter who died on the front lines in Ukraine. That's the text I've been waiting for all day. From Kiev to Saskatchewan, the team effort to bring a loved one home and... Could magic mushrooms be good for your mental health? But this is something that can help me to have a better quality of life. How Canadian doctors are using psychedelics to treat anxiety and depression. We're back in two. The first phase of the ban on single-use plastic starts on Tuesday. It covers things like plastic checkout bags, cutlery and some takeout containers. And they won't be disappearing right away, but they can't be manufactured or imported. You've probably noticed that those plastic grocery bags are already getting scarce, but as Sophia Harris reports, their replacements are causing a new problem. Larry Grant applauds the ban on plastic bags, but says this is not a smart alternative. Grant gets weekly grocery pickup from Walmart, where the plastic bags were nixed in April. Now, each order arrives in new reusable bags. So far totaling about 300. Are you able to reuse all of these? No, I can't. I'm really frustrated. I just hope they will think about this failure, I would say and uh, come up with a solution. We get like 10 to 15 of them every single week. Natalie and Udi Sela get Walmart grocery delivery. They too are overwhelmed. We can't return them, we can't really do much with them. This is something that, you know, it's supposed to resolve an environmental issue, but at the same time it actually creates more waste. It's the right thing to do. Walmart says its plastic bag ban is a win for the environment. But experts say this is a problem because reusable bags aren't always worthwhile. Because of the types of materials that you use and the manufacturing process that you use, to make a more durable reusable bag, you're just ending up using more energy. The environmental benefits are accrued when you use it again and again. A recent United Nations study found a polypropylene bag needs to be used 10 to 20 times, a cotton one up to 150 times to have a less harmful impact on the environment than a single-use plastic bag. Just making that switch from single-use to reusable isn't always going to just end up better for the environment. With the federal government phasing out all single-use plastic shopping bags in Canada, we could see a lot more of these especially as grocery delivery grows in popularity. Grocer Metro says it has a solution. 
customers can get their groceries delivered in a reusable plastic bin. It's never ending. Look at that. But some Walmart customers are still waiting for an end to this. The company says it's exploring alternatives. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. This year, two Canadians have died fighting in Ukraine, including veteran Joseph Hildebrand. He wanted the farm life and the family life, but he also wanted to constantly go be with his like brotherhood and go help. Up next, his family's complicated journey to bring him home. Plus... It was, it was a shock to everybody, for sure. An unexpected passenger flies in for a free ride in our moment. Canada isn't sending combat troops to Ukraine, but that hasn't stopped some Canadians from joining the fight. Tonight, we have the story of one veteran who died in combat and the efforts to bring him home with honour. Joseph Hildebrand died in November after volunteering to fight. His family spent weeks trying to bring him back. Sam Sampson now with an intimate look at how it happened. Come on in, grab a seat. Uh, sounds like Josiah should hopefully actually be in Canadian airspace right now. So Wonderful. We're, we're there. there. It's we're the day. There. We're in the home stretch. This is it. It's taken a long time, but Carissa Hildebrand finally gets to bring her love, Joseph, home. I'm just anxious and excited and yeah. ready. Joseph Hildebrand left for Ukraine in June. The 33-year-old Canadian veteran died early November, volunteering on the front lines, getting his body from Ukraine's Donetsk region to Swift Current, Saskatchewan, would take a mountain of unexpected effort, negotiating for weeks with foreign officials while fighting back grief. I'm ready to actually just have my breakdown and grieve, Joe. It's time. Do you mm -hmm. find like you're holding it all in until yes. a certain moment? <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Joe absolutely loved to sing. He sang all the time. You look so happy. We were. I've never been happier in my life. Same with Joe V, so. Yeah. This hat he just wore every day and it still smells like his sweat, so I hung on to it. I know it's weird, but. They were together for eight years. This is the year that Joe adopted Jovi, so we took family photos. Building a family and a life. What did you think of that decision for him to go? Like, I have to respect his decision. I, I, tr I have trouble understanding it. This is exactly what I was always worried about every time he wanted to go help. He wanted the farm life and the family life, but he also wanted to constantly go be with his, like, brotherhood and go help. It's two different worlds. Some Canadians may choose uh, to take more active steps. Uh, Canada warned people not to go to Ukraine. There wasn't much the government could do if the worst happened. And I got a call and it said Ukraine. And I just like instantly kind of knew if that makes sense. It was like, oh no. Well, that would be his old military tags. Ukraine officials brought Joseph's remains from the front line to Kyiv for cremation. Their plan to ship him home would take months. Global Affairs Canada was in touch with the family, but Ukraine called the shots. Joseph was a volunteer soldier. His military uniform and his pins. Over in Niagara Falls, Ontario, Steve Kersnick, part of Joseph's military family, jumped into action. I reached out to a bunch of other uh, humanitarian groups that I'm kind of connected with and said, hey, listen, like, we have this fallen veteran, we got to get him back. Uh, let's start planning the, you know, the leg of the route on how he's going to go, what, what paperwork do we have to get. Steve and Joseph served in Afghanistan as part of the Princess Patricia Canadian Light Infantry. Joseph wouldn't get a military funeral. He died a private citizen. Still, his family wanted him escorted home with dignity. It's not that we're asking for a lot, we just, we wanted to, have someone repatriate Joseph home because we didn't want him alone being shipped in a box like an Amazon package. That's where another army brother comes in. This is Joseph Hildebrandt, 
and myself for our kit chained up together. Pick up the urn tomorrow in Lviv. Josiah Napier knew Joseph for years. He was in Ukraine when Joseph died. He volunteered to bring the remains home, delaying his own trip back by a month. My wife wants me home. If it had been me and there had been no advocate here, it would have been a pretty hellish process. So I stayed because it's the right thing to do. Joe is sitting up front with us. He hitched a ride out of Ukraine with a foreign soldier. Thank you, Andrew, for getting us here. It's my pleasure to help. 14 hours to Germany. And we are getting ready to board for Canada. And a nine and a half hour flight to Calgary, all for Joseph's family, who Josiah had never met. 407, our time, he wrote, made it to Calgary. So they're there. That's the text I've been waiting for all day. Now, the home stretch. They've decided to meet in Medicine Hat. The moment, built up for weeks, is all Carissa can see. It's going to be strange to go home with Joe. Like, very strange. <sighs> Hi, Josiah. <laughs> Finally, Joseph is home. <sighs> It's a tragedy all military families fear. So this one makes a promise. If another Canadian dies in Ukraine, they'll help bring them home. <laughs> this is gonna happen to another family, and another family, and another family, and something needs to be done. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's their way of bringing dignity to the brutality of war. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Medicine Hat, Alberta. It's estimated 550 Canadians are fighting in Kyiv as of May. No word on the overall numbers. Coming up, Canadian researchers are exploring a new treatment for mental health. Your entire being is that emotional feeling. How magic mushrooms are being used to treat anxiety and depression and... Sick kids get a visit from some hockey heroes. For people facing a terminal diagnosis, depression and anxiety only add to the suffering. New research, though, suggests a certain psychedelic drug could help ease those symptoms. Here's Nick Purden on the potential of magic mushrooms. So over here, this is the room where I have done my first two psychedelic therapy sessions. So right here is uh, where the first legal use of psilocybin therapy happened in Canada. Psilocybin, if you're wondering, is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And Thomas Hartle was the first Canadian to legally take them. Psilocybe cubensis. This is footage of Thomas about to go on that first psychedelic trip in 2020. Next to him is a doctor and one of Thomas's good friends. Uh, it was a, a very uh, pure emotional experience. Your entire being is that emotional feeling. So it isn't a matter of feeling it. You, you are that experience. In any given year, hundreds of thousands of Canadians experience depression and anxiety. Could magic mushrooms be a revolution in their treatment? Or as Canadian law tells us right now, are they a dangerous substance we should avoid? To understand how Thomas, in his 50s, found himself hallucinating in his basement in Saskatoon, we need to go back a few years. Back to the day he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. The anxiety for that was really consuming my, my every minute of every waking day. It felt like I was actively dying. Thomas tried conventional ways to care for his end of life anxiety, such as therapy and meditation. He tried antidepressants too. I know that antidepressants for me were, were able to take like the peaks off of anxiety, but uh, they also were taking the peaks off of things like happiness and, and love. When nothing worked, Thomas decided to try magic mushrooms. He applied to Health Canada, and a few months later, they gave him a special exemption to use psilocybin pills 
in the presence of a medical professional. Thomas says after his four-hour psilocybin experience, the symptoms of his anxiety were basically gone. It gave me the ability to approach the idea that someday I'm going to die and I'm not going to be there when my family needs me. It doesn't change the way that I feel about dying. It has changed the way that I think about the entire concept of death and dying. So unlike a, a drug which changes how you're feeling while you are taking it, this is something that has changed my perspective on it. But here's the thing. Health Canada only gave Thomas the right to use psilocybin for one year, and that's expired. He's asked for a renewal, but months later, he's still waiting. As it stands today, it would be illegal to do it here in this room for you. For me right now, it would be completely illegal. So that which was previously the most safe and secure that I could possibly have is now something that would be illegal for me to do. All the way over your feet? Yes, okay, how does that feel? Okay. For like a million bucks? There is another way to okay. legally get psilocybin in Canada. You need to find a doctor who's willing to apply for you. That's what Dr. Michael Verbora does for some of his patients. For him, psychedelics are the future of medicine. Remember, you will also have a guide with you at all times to ensure your safety and maximize the healing potential of this psychedelic experience. I got out of med school, uh, well, well, residency about seven or eight years ago, and, and I knew at that moment I could not do what I was trained to do, which is to continue to prescribe pills every day for patients with chronic illnesses who weren't getting better. It was beating my head against the wall. Dr. Verbora is a doctor at Field Trip Health, a private clinic in Toronto that specializes in psychedelics. He says because it's difficult to get permission to use psilocybin, he's only able to administer it to one or two patients a month. Mio Yokoi has stage four pancreatic cancer and end of life anxiety. I thought to myself, if this is something that can help me to have a better quality of life for whatever time I have left, then I would like to try to um, experience that as much as possible. I believe that magic mushrooms can help me not suffer at the end of my life. Mio wants to spread the message that psilocybin helped her. That's why she allowed us to film her treatment. Dr. Verbora never leaves a patient's side during their experience. And he tells me what he believes the psilocybin molecule is doing inside Mio's brain. He says it's like a reboot. If you run software 24-7 on your iPhone or your computer, it starts to get slow and bogged down and it doesn't work good. But if you close all the software, you reset the computer, it tends to be faster and more efficient. And that's how these molecules work. They temporarily suspend the way that we normally think and they allow different parts of our brain to communicate with one another that typically don't communicate. Dr. Verboro is convinced that psilocybin works. Um, but at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, psychiatrist Dr. Ishrat Hussein isn't so sure. I don't think at this moment that we can say for certain that psilocybin is safe and effective uh, for depression or any other mental health condition. Uh, there is encouraging evidence that it could be safe and effective, but nothing conclusive at present. Dr. Hussein is the lead investigator in a new trial the first of its kind commissioned by Health Canada to test whether psilocybin works. So this is the CAMH psychedelic assisted psychotherapy treatment room. When we're administering the treatment, we want it to be quite ambient, soft lighting, uh, as relaxing as possible uh, for people. Dr. Hussein says there's another question he hopes the trial will answer. Now. That's whether psilocybin actually needs to induce a psychedelic trip uh, to have therapeutic benefits. Uh, it's assumed uh, psilocybin uh, acts by, by sort of inducing this very powerful hallucinogenic experience, uh, and that's why people seek benefit from that approach. Uh, but as yet, nobody's tested that hypothesis. That's important because if there's no psychedelic effect, then a patient wouldn't need as much support and the treatment wouldn't be as expensive. These days, Thomas Hartle meditates to try to cope with his anxiety. But he's not giving up on access to psilocybin. In fact, he's taking Health Canada to court as part of a charter challenge. What I am asserting 
is that it is my right to have access to this treatment is my right to live and be healthy here in Canada. Um, right now, the only way that I can do that is by having access to psilocybin-assisted therapy. Health Canada won't comment the, uh, on Hartle's situation because it's before well, the, the courts. Uh, I, I don't know how I would manage to live with that. Um, without access to that kind of a therapy, it, um, having both cancer and being in this extreme state of anxiety, um, for me, it's not, it's not really living anymore. Nick Purden, CBC News, Saskatoon. Sky-high inflation is making almost everything more expensive these days, including romance. Hey, I'm just on a budget, or hey, I'm, I'm trying to save costs this month. Coming up, how the push to save money is changing the dating scene. Plus... This is wild. His tail touched the front of the jeep. A feathery hitchhiker joins a couple's road trip in our moment. Well, after a pandemic pause, a nearly century-old Christmas tradition is back, linking the Toronto Maple Leafs and Sick Kids Hospital. We're going to be here to, uh, just like I said, try to uh, brighten their day up, have, have uh, some time away from what they're going through, especially uh, during the holidays. It means a lot. These patients got to see the Leafs practice. They got some autographs and did a few crafts, some with the players. There was also a North Pole All-Star on hand to hear to hand out some gifts. This was the first in-person event for the Leafs and sick kids since 2019. Okay, inflation has Canadians feeling financial pressures in almost every area, including their love lives. Putting a squeeze on singles looking for that special someone. Paula Dohatchik shows us a reality you're unlikely to see in a rom-com. Bree Woolard has been in a lot of coffee shops meeting a lot of new people. She's in the middle of a self-imposed experiment to go on 50 first dates as a way of getting past a breakup. I've been on about 30 of them so far, um, since about May or June of this year, and it's been a lot of fun. I'm back with 50 first dates. Fun, but along the way, the dates, well, they've been getting cheaper. And even when it did get fancy once, she unexpectedly wound up footing the bill. I shrugged it off. I said, like, we still had a great time. Um, but I think it, going forward, it, I think it's important more today than it used to be to have that conversation up front and say like, hey, I'm just on a budget or hey, I'm, I'm trying to save costs this month. For better or worse, more people are trying to save costs these days while looking for love. A recent survey of people using the dating app Bumble says most are more interested in inexpensive dates. Another from Match.com says many singles are stressed about money and are open to cheaper activities. They haven't stopped courting. But they are uh, trimming back uh, to save money. No question about it. David Urington is getting creative to trim back his dating budget. I've been looking at more lower cost alternatives like going out for skating and hot chocolate or even making a home cooked meals and experimenting with new cocktails in the house. He says it's just as easy to get to know someone that way. Luckily, the woman he's dating is on the same page. It wasn't a conversation that happened right away. It, takes some time to get, it took some time to get a bit more comfortable with each other. And while it's a tricky conversation to have, one expert says real talk about money can make couples stronger. It might force them to be a little more uh, vulnerable, which potentially then could be a, an opportunity to grow closer as a couple and decide that you do want to pursue something. As for Brie Woolard, she's got about 20 more dates to go. I'm not trying to find the one, it's just meeting people and, and meeting who's out there. While making sure she doesn't break the bank. Paula Duhatchek, CBC News, Calgary. Imagine driving down the highway and suddenly this flying fella decides to hitch a ride. This is exactly what happened to Alex Lavoie and his girlfriend. On a recent trip home from Yukon, they had some unexpected company, a friendly raven flying alongside them for 45 minutes. And tonight, this feathered hitchhiker is our moment. I was doing about 80 kilometers an hour down a, a hill when all of a sudden there's 
a raven that swooped down over the top of my Jeep and uh, started to glide along very, very close. I didn't think it was going to last, but about 30 seconds in, my girlfriend Jody was sleeping beside me, and I pulled my phone out of my pocket and tossed it on her lap. And I was like, hey, hey, we got to start recording this. This is wild. His tail touched the front of the Jeep. I'm not entirely sure whether it was anticipating food, which it did end up getting, or if it was just catching a free ride. Whether you look at it as a spiritual thing or a hitchhiking bird, it was an amazing experience, something great to see, and I'm really happy that I got to share it. Yeah, you saw there the couple actually stopped and fed the bird, and then he continued on their journey. He actually only left when another bird swooped in, and they took off together to play in the snow. Just incredible. That's the National for December 19th. Have a good night.